uh, Wendy, great to be uh, back uh, with you. And Anya, thank you uh, very much for, for all this. So Wendy, uh, uh, assuming that you heard most of what uh, Brian had to, to say there, um, let me start with this. Three years, nearly four years into the uh, Trump administration, um, where are we with Iran to your mind compared to where we were on the day that you, uh, you left office or the day that President Obama did? Obviously, the president exited the, uh, the agreement more than two years ago. Um, tell us where you think that's gotten us. I think it's gotten us to a pretty bad place, uh, quite frankly. I think Brian was uh, very fluent and he was very uh, well-spoken about his uh, and President Trump's approach to Iran. Uh, but here we are after the deal that was reached in 2015. We have no deal. Iran is now enriching at higher levels with more centrifuges. Um, they are still supporting proxies in the region. They are still undertaking malign behavior in the region. They are still putting Americans and others into Evan prison. Uh, they are still abusing the rights of their own people. Uh, they are not a responsible player in the international community. So I appreciate that uh, the Trump administration has put on a maximum pressure campaign, and they indeed have. Uh, but what it has gotten them, and Brian said this himself, is resistance and actions, in my view, in the wrong direction. So I think the administration has had a series of tactics, but it is not clear to me at all what the strategic objective is. Uh, the administration said it's not regime change, uh, and yet I think that will occur. Uh, they've said they're creating leverage to get a better negotiation, uh, but I think we all see that Iran is nowhere close to negotiating with the Trump administration. So I think we're in a quite uh, worse place. Well, the essence of um, Brian's argument was essentially this, that if you um, terminated the agreement and put enough pressure on the Iranians, uh, economic pressure, kind of suffering their economy has gone through, cutting off the oil. They will come back and agree to some kind of a revised form of, the, of what you negotiated uh, five years and a few weeks ago, <laughs> uh, but that it would include no enrichment ever. And that the fatal flaw to their mind of what you negotiated was that 15 years out, uh, from that agreement, they would begin to be able to enrich anew. Right. Well, we can debate the quote unquote sunset clauses of the deal. And I think every arms control deal generally has a follow on deal. So we could have that debate. Uh, but I think this notion uh, of the fundamental issue here of whether, in fact, Iran has a right to a civil nuclear program, which they do under the NPT, uh, and of course, uh, we all would hope that everybody would sign up to the one, two, three gold standard that the UAE has, um, but that was not to be here. And President Obama, uh, along with all of the other members of the P5 plus one, the permanent members of the Security Council, European Union, and Germany, supported uh, 15 to zero by the Security Council believe that it was critical to ensure Iran not get a nuclear weapon, because if they had a nuclear weapon, their ability to project power into the region would be profound, and it would deter our, our allies and partners' ability to act on all of the other issues of concern, which are of concern to all of us. You said before that you believe they had a series of tactics, but not strategy, and you wrote last week um, that that belief sort of stretched across a number of other areas. So let me take you into a few of the others and we'll, we'll come back to Iran uh, by reference. Um, but start in the Middle East. A, a good deal of your concern about um, the reason we needed an Iran deal was to stop proliferation through the rest of the region. You heard Brian talk a little bit about how the UAE had now been 10 years into their one, two, three agreement, their agreement to basically get civilian nuclear power without going to enrichment. We now have doubts that the Saudis are uh, staying on that, on that run. So tell us where you think 
we are in our dealings with Saudi Arabia tactically. Obviously, the, the administration has given them a very, very long leash. Uh, does, that, does that leash extend now to being able to have their own enrichment cycle? Well, we've also heard President Trump talk about giving nuclear technology to Saudi Arabia. And he famously said, so what if everybody has nuclear weapons? Uh, totally misunderstanding the risks that are inherent in proliferation of nuclear weapons. We're really heading in the wrong direction around arms control, around nuclear technology and nuclear weapons. And as uh, you pointed out, and Nick Schifrin pointed out in the last interview, there are now reports that China is helping Saudi Arabia extract yellow cake from uranium ore, a very concerning step forward. Uh, and many people believe that Saudi Arabia has a lock on a nuclear weapon in Pakistan's ar arsenal. Um, it will be very dangerous if in fact, we have proliferation of nuclear weapons around the world and we are seeing that the administration is not moving forward in extending the New START agreement with Russia and time is running out on strategic arms control as well. So I think we're in a very bad place. And I wrote the piece uh, in Foreign Policy uh, about really the Trump administration not having a foreign policy because we've seen with Russia no overarching uh, strategy, no ability to take on Russia, including in whether Russia's given weapons to the Taliban, whether they've offered bounties for killing American soldiers, absolutely no action in that regard. Uh, we've seen them not move forward on arms control with Russia or push back with Russia in any way, shape, or form. With China, we've seen a trade deal that now is quite suspect whether it'll ever produce any real result, and only a maximum pressure strategy, it appears now, or tweaking China by sending the HHS uh, Secretary Azar to Taiwan to drive the Chinese nuts. Uh, we haven't really taken the action on Hong Kong that we need to or on the Uyghurs in terms of human rights. And finally, coming back to the Middle East, David, you know well that we all waited for Jared Kushner to put on the table his Middle East peace plan. That's gone completely by the wayside. We now see uh, in the terrible tragedy of yesterday, uh, over 100 people killed in Lebanon by those horrific blasts, thousands injured. The Lebanese were already struggling, uh, and now we have a horrifying situation of meltdown, uh, a lot of questions about Israel's future and their security, certainly no future for the Palestinian people in sight. Uh, so we're really in a very tough place, and I, I don't see a strategy to really tackle these issues in the Trump administration. So let's take it on to Russia. So um, we're in this critical couple of months. If you go back exactly four years, August was where we began to see um, WikiLeaks uh, documents being leaked by the Russians to WikiLeaks. Something uh, you know a bit about. Yeah, we've, we've seen a little bit of that. Uh, we now see um, the Russians working on a different playbook if um, whoever wins the next election, what is the room that we have to deal with the Russians given the current set of behavior, separate and apart from whether we have only tactics or a strategy? Putin's clearly got a strategy, but I'm not sure it's one we can work with. I think we're in a very tough place in general. Um, obviously, I don't think it's a secret. I'm a Democrat. I hope that Joe Biden becomes President of the United States. And one of the reasons is because the way that we can operate more effectively in the world is to build back our alliances and our partnerships, whether that's the alliance with NATO, the alliance with our European allies, uh, our alliance certainly with uh, states in the Gulf, our alliance with countries in Africa and Latin America, so that we work in a collective strategy. Europe has much more to be concerned about in an immediate physical way, geographic way about Russia than we even do. They trade with Russia at a very high rate. The United States does not. So Europe has leverage that we do not in building and refashioning a relationship with Russia that is on our terms for where we wanna see the future. 
Likewise, a strategy with China cannot be effectively achieved without us working with others, looking after our national interest in the first instance, of course, because that's any president's responsibility. But unless we work effectively with our allies and partners in the first instance, we won't have the that we need to get things done that are in our interest. And taking your same argument over to China, uh, it strikes me that in listening to this campaign, there's sort of a race to the bottom here about who could sound tougher on China. Uh, you heard uh, Vice President Biden uh, in his statements er earlier this year, the argument that President Trump would have been willing to give up way too much to the Chinese for the hope of a trade deal. You've heard uh, President Trump argue uh, a move from uh, that uh, he was cooperating wonderfully with his good friend Xi to referring to the coronavirus as the Wuhan virus or the China virus. So it strikes me that whoever gets elected, we're going to be in a pretty bad place. What's our leverage? If you were coming into the China file today, what would it be? I think our leverage are several things. One, a brand new day, a uh, mm -hmm. forward that will be different, working with those allies and partners to bring us working together to deal with China. There is no doubt there are tremendous chi challenges with China, but some of those challenges are about the investments we also make in our own economy for innovation, for artificial intelligence, quantum computing, um, all of the infrastructure that we need to be able to compete with China and work with our partners to do so, uh, to challenge China where we must, whether that's in the South China Sea, if they try to steal uh, secrets from our corporations and from our community, um, and to see where there are any places where we can work with China, certainly on climate change. Unless we are working as an international community, we will not achieve what we need to achieve. The east coast of the United States just went through a tropical storm of tremendous uh, force over the last 24 hours. Um, I, uh, here in uh, Cambridge, uh, didn't really get touched except by a downpour. Lots of people lost power, but there were tornado warnings on Cape Cod. Uh, there were tornado warnings on the eastern shore of Maryland. That's never happened before. The world is changing and we have to look for where we can cooperate with people as well. But I think that a Biden administration, any administration, is going to have to be able to compete, to invest in our own infrastructure and our own technology, our own innovation, compete with China, be ready to challenge and confront China when we need to, and look for those couple of places where we might actually be able to cooperate. It's a very nuanced and complex strategy I don't think the current administration is up to such a strategy. It's been a very tactical approach. I, I think we'll need a pretty sophisticated approach to be successful. Well, one more question from me before we go to the audience. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when um, you were just doing North Korea. <laughs> yeah, okay, I talked about those lovely folks, yes. So, um, so we're emerging after two years and a few months after the Singapore summit with a North Korea that by some estimates has an arsenal that is roughly doubled in size. You don't hear the president talk about North Korea very much anymore. He doesn't even talk about the lovely letters he was getting from <laughs> Kim Jong-un. Um, you never dealt with Kim Jong-un, you dealt with his father. Uh, but uh, again, if we were stepping, if you were stepping back into your old job uh, on January 20th, uh, and who knows, maybe you will be. Uh, but if you, uh, if you were, where would you start with a North Korea that now probably has somewhere between 20 and 50 nuclear, probably 30 and 50 nuclear weapons? Well, I'd first rebuild my relationship with South Korea and Japan. Uh, it, I wouldn't be arguing over uh, whether South Korea is paying enough for American troops. They do pay for American troops. Um, our, this is in our interest to have our troops there. We always should look at our force posture. I know that Secretary Esper is going to be speaking next, and he may talk about our force posture both in Germany and in uh, Korea. Uh, uh, I think the decisions that have been made there have not been the right ones, but nonetheless, um, 
I think that I would be rebuilding that relationship. I would be looking at how we can move together with North Korea. This is a very, very tough problem. Uh, it is tougher even than Iran uh, because nuclear, because North Korea has nuclear weapons and the means to deliver them. I don't believe that Kim Jong-un is suicidal, uh, so I would hope he would never use them, uh, but he certainly has established uh, a deterrence in many ways. Uh, and so this is a tough way forward. I think it'll take a lot of hard work to see if there is an opening, but we won't be able to do it on our own. This may be one place where we can work with China, but probably not in the first instance, because I think China's in a position where they now like having North Korea back on the field as a chip in on their poker table, not a chip on ours. And we're gonna have to do a lot of work Use the Security Council, use the United Nations, uh, even use this COVID crisis uh, to try to find our way back. There is no doubt uh, that China um, shares uh, a lot of responsibility for where we are for not having transparency around COVID. Uh, but it is also a place where we are all going to have to work together. One of the things I need to say about not only North Korea, but China in particular, is the current administration's um, uh, destabilizing multilateral organizations around the world have only left a vacuum for China to move in and try to take control. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is one of those places uh, where we should not lose our seat at the table because China will only be too happy to take it. But at this point, don't you think we pretty much have to accept North Korea as a nuclear power the way we've ended up accepting Pakistan as a nuclear power? I don't think we should literally and uh, forcefully accept them as a nuclear power. I think that it is important uh, to maintain the belief that the nuclear power or the five original nuclear powers, yes, Pakistan and India have gained uh, nuclear weapons. Um, they have, uh, India at least, has become de facto a member of the NPT. They've always been strong around non-proliferation and the US has had long-standing relationship, which I hope is still intact in terms of the security of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Uh, but I think that once you start announcing that someone is a nuclear weapon state, you are opening the door to saying others can become one as well. And even though some may believe it is a difference uh, without a distinction, I think it's a very important distinction. Great. So um, we have a few questions that have come up and to remind uh, those who are uh, participating, you can uh, raise your hand uh, uh, using that feature in participants. We're gonna start with Drew, Drew Dornstatter. Drew? Are we hearing from Drew? Drew, are you on? Maybe if Drew just unmutes or if someone will unmute him even if he can't do video. Okay, we're not hearing Drew, so why don't we hey, move uh, on to you. Oh. oh, very good. Okay, Drew, your question. Yes, thanks, forgive that uh, delay. Under Secretary, thanks for this question. Um, would you please address the tension between the U.S.-led construct and the European-led uh, maritime awareness construct around the Strait of Hormuz and, and how that creates tension between the United States and uh, our allies? Uh, anything else you'd like to offer? Thanks a lot. Well, Drew, I don't know you, but I would guess from uh, your question that you either are current or former military and have probably greater insight into um, uh, the posture in the Strait of Hormuz than I do. Uh, but what I will say is we care about commerce being able to move through the Strait of Hormuz, though it is less of an immediate necessity for the United States in terms of oil, certainly these days, uh, but it is certainly of great concern to us. Uh, we hope and want the Europeans to um, help share the burden of making sure that the strait remains open. And I think the differences that we have attest to the issue that um, David and I have been talking about, which is 
we simply do not have the relationship with Europe that we must, that we need to. We are always stronger when we are working with others than when we work by ourselves. Uh, Wendy, we're going to go on to Michelle Nichols. Jean? Michelle, are you able to hear us? I think she's trying to unmute or get someone to unmute her because I see her name on the screen. Yeah. We don't all have this 100% down yet, Wendy. Um, there we go. Michelle, can you hear us? Maybe not. Why don't we go on to uh, Jeannie uh, Nugent. Jeannie, are you able to hear us? You want to ask your question? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Can you hear me? Thank yep. you, Secretary. Would you tell us what you think the Biden administration would do in the South China Sea during the eight years that Biden was vice president with Obama? They had been very um, slow and let the Scarborough show been lost to China, to the current situation. Now, if there was a tens tension, uh, if the tension is higher, would there be a kinetic conflict? And what would Biden do? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm not here as a surrogate for the Biden administration, so I don't want to speak uh, for the vice president. What I can say is that um, I believe that President Obama Vice President Biden, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Clinton had a very uh, assertive approach to the South China Sea. Quite frankly, it was Secretary Clinton uh, with uh, President Obama who first raised these issues, spent a lot of time working with ASEAN and with other partners in the region uh, to put together a concerted strategy, including with the Philippines, uh, to try to challenge China in what it was doing in the South China Sea. Uh, I would suspect that you would see in a Biden administration as part of an overall strategy, that challenge continue and hard work, hard diplomatic work uh, with ASEAN and with other partners in the region uh, to push back, uh, including uh, any legal means to do so, as you pointed out uh, on the Scarborough Shoals uh, and decision by The Hague. So I think this will, again, be a tough problem, uh, but one that we have to go about in a concerted way, working with those in the region who have much more at stake in an immediate geographic way, even than the United States does. But we are a Pacific power, not just an Atlantic power. So this is an issue of great concern to us as well. OK. And one last very quick question, because we're just about out of time, from Joshua Walker. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. So, Wendy, thank you for your presentation. The question I have is, a, is a hopefully a real simple one, which is there's a lot of news out of the Middle East, not just about the horrific, uh, you know, uh, the explosion in Beirut, but about Saudi Arabia making a deal with China, uh, China making a deal uh, with Iran. What do you think the future of kind of nonproliferation in the region and the world more broadly looks like uh, from here on out? Uh, it's a very concerning one. Uh, there's a terrific piece by Jessica Matthews in the New York Review of Books uh, talking about the nuclear future, uh, reviewing uh, four books that have come out recently, and none of it looks very good. Uh, I think that you point out, Joshua, in your question, one of the points that I think is really important. We see an informal, if not a formal, relationship between Russia, China, and Iran. Uh, there has been a strategic document that's been agreed to between Russia and Iran, one with China and Iran that is 
uh, being undergone. There are other players. Uh, Turkey might end up being part of this uh, nexus of uh, players who try to thwart some of the things that are uh, concerned by the United States of America. Uh, so I think both on the non-proliferation front as well as how we are working to solve the problems that threaten our security and the security of the world, including proliferation of nuclear weapons, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I hope that uh, a President Bush gets to try to do it, and I think he will make uh, tremendous progress. Wendy, thank you very much for the time you've uh, spent with us for your uh, previous service. We're going to be wanting to hear from you a lot in uh, the coming months as we head toward uh, the campaign. And uh, we will now um, thank you and, and throw it back to, uh, to Anya and to our, our next speaker.